Okay, welcome to everybody. First of all, of course, children are the forefront of our external uh, activities because they are one third of the world population. Uh, they are 2.2 billion. Yeah, they were in 2010. There will be 2.5 billion more by 2025. One out of three live in, uh, in uh, slum conditions, six out of 10 in Africa. 13 uh, under five children die every minute for preventable uh, causes. 22.5 million uh, are not vaccinated before their first birthday. And uh, one third of child death are caused by malnutrition and undernutrition. <coughs> Therefore, the, for the, given this situation, the EU is uh, uh, committed to uh, promote and protect child rights in its external activities since uh, 2005 uh, with the EU consensus, sorry, it's not in the slide, but the EU consensus already con on development, already integrated the, the child rights in among the cross-cutting that should have been uh, promoted and integrated in its uh, external activities. In three, uh, with a three-track approach, uh, with the specific actions, like for uh, fighting against violence against children or trafficking children, with uh, actions which are, of course, uh, naturally uh, destined to, to children, like uh, education, but also with mainstreaming, with the integration of child rights, protection and promotion in all other activities uh, aiming at development. This has been uh, uh, reconfirmed in 2007 in the EU guidelines for the promotion and protection of child rights, and in 2008, immediately after the communication, uh, the guidelines was a council conclusion was uh, endorsed, where the council uh, confirmed its, uh, its commitment for the EU Commission, for the EU institution, but also for the member states uh, to fight in the, for the promotion and protection of child rights. Uh, human rights is, of course, in our uh, it's our principle since uh, the beginning of the EU, but confirmed in the Lisbon Treaty. The Article 3 and 21st uh, speak about human rights in general. Of course, child rights are integrated. But after that, there are plenty of other documents in which human rights or right-based approach is uh, defined as one of the principles for our cooperation. Um, the last one has been the EU Strategy Framework and Action Plan for Human Rights and Democracy, uh, adopted in 2012 by the External Service and uh, endorsed by the Council, in which, of course, uh, human rights approach is uh, defined as uh, the uh, approach which has to, uh, to be integrated in all our activities for, uh, for uh, development cooperation and external policies in general. Therefore, uh, we decided to uh, create, uh, to, to ask UNICEF and their experts uh, to create together with us a toolkit to learn, to, to be able to teach our colleagues working in the field, working in, uh, in delegations, but also us here in, uh, in the headquarters, how to do it, how to integrate child rights in whatever we do. Uh, so you can have a look at it. It's here just for display, sorry for that, but we decided for uh, economical reasons to not print thousands of copies. So they are, you can download them from the website. There will be the address in the next slides. The, it will be available in four languages by the end of the year. In English, of course, it's already available. French and Spanish, I think, will be ready soon. And the next will be Portuguese. Hopefully one day we'll be able to translate also in Arabic. It is, uh, um, it is really uh, a toolkit. How to do it? In uh, well, the colleague from UNICEF will explain in details uh, how how it is uh, organized. And the idea is to support not only us, but also, of course everybody who's working uh, in development uh, in, in the integration of child rights in uh, in their activities. 
so it's it addressed to us, to bilateral donors, our member states, of course, to the local government and to development partners, to NGOs. It can be used by whoever is interested in child rights and whoever is interested in development. I leave the floor to Verena Knaus from UNICEF, who's uh, my partner in this, uh, <laughs> in this uh, target. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina, and thank you, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's been a long and, uh, and challenging task to try to concentrate, uh, on the one hand, the knowledge, expertise, and practical guidance on child rights, and to marry this really with the practical realities of how development cooperation programming, planning, project cycle management is really taking place as we're speaking now at EU level. Um, so my, my task now is really to try to introduce to you the toolkit as a product. Uh, time is very short, so we won't be able to go into as much detail, but I will try to at least give you an overview, a flavor, a taste of what you can find in there, what kind of guidance, what kind of topics, what kind of themes, and also perhaps a little bit of a background of what we think and how we conceived it together with uh, colleagues at the European Commission, how it could really meet the objectives of both really making a difference in children's lives, making development cooperation more effective, more efficient, and by doing this, really provide the kind of guidance that is needed and that is useful and that is relevant for everyone here. So maybe just briefly let me start with sort of the basic assumption and uh, strong conviction on our side uh, shared broadly. In real life, there is, of course, no divide. I mean, sometimes we conceive that there is sort of the child rights world and child rights advocates on the one hand advocating for a particular issue, a particular set of rights. On the other hand, there is development and policy practitioners who try to think about you know, transport and energy policies and road development and broader, you know, in broader terms, the sustainable uh, development agenda. But if you're really thinking it through, there is no such divide. Because in order to realize children's rights, um, development and policy interventions by default need to be child sensitive. And as Marina already said, a third of the world's population are children. In most of the developing countries, they constitute even more than half the population. So not considering children as one plans development is almost as if a private sector is trying to sell or trying to promote something to a market and just ignoring half of the, the audience. Um, so I think it's very, very clear that realizing children's rights and realizing the legal and political commitments that are very strong and have been growing, as as well already Marina pointed out, without integrating a child rights perspective into processes, into programming, into policy making, um, cannot work. And on the other hand, of course, in order for development and policies that aim at promoting inclusive growth, sustainable development, reducing poverty, achieving the MDG objectives, in order to do this and to make this effective and sustainable, uh, children's rights again need to be integrated. So in the end, by marrying these two approaches and by really bringing together and creating a meaningful partnership and building on the partnership in our case that exists, that is how we can achieve such sustainable, effective development outcomes and at the same time realize rights. So it, within our own thinking, this is sort of the double dividend. It's a win-win on both sides. And, uh, and that does very much the thinking behind uh, the process of the toolkit and the design of the toolkit. In terms of the structure of what you find in the toolkit itself, um, it consists of eight modules. And broadly speaking, there are two modules that sort of you know, set the tone, um, and six particular ones that are very specific on thematic areas. Um, you probably, as I will go through the different topics and, and, and themes that we had been um, in the end deciding to include, there are things that are missing. And I think it is important to say from the outset, and we also see this very much as a first step. At best, it is incomplete. Um, you know, it will also probably be overtaken by events with new policies, new developments, new discussions taking place at global and European level. But that is why I think it's so important that we now have it out there and test it and see where and what can be improved, be taken further, can be contextualized, can be added to, and what already is out there that may be complementary. Um, so that may be just as a, as a, as a starting point. So in terms of the structure, what you have, there is an overview module um, which really sets out um, what you need to know from our perspective about children's rights and what resources there are and what is it that you need to know in order to really integrate children's rights meaningfully as you're thinking about programming and, uh, and development cooperation more broadly. Module two then really looks sort of at the specifics of the programming and project cycle management cycle. And then there are six thematic areas from participation to governance, impact assessments, 
budgeting, uh, one specifically focused on the, the, the space between humanitarian interventions and development, and then one specifically on uh, civil society organizations. So let me maybe just quickly walk you through some of them in a little bit more detail so that you have a sense of what you could be looking out for in the modules. So module one and module two is really about learning and understanding the relevant rights of children under the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also linking this really with what are the equivalent commitments on the EU side where these two actually uh, converge, where human rights commitments, child rights commitments on the EU side and commitments under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which are relevant, of course, for the EU, for bilateral donors, and most particularly for the government partners in, 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 in the countries that, where development cooperation is, is focused, what is it that you need to know to meaningfully integrate them in development thinking, planning, and programming? And then really, module two looks at how then operationally this can be done. So a little bit module one is more the theory and setting out where we are in terms of legal political commitments and how one can think about child rights, what approaches, what key principles one needs to sort of integrate and incorporate as one goes about thinking about the practical ways of integrating it um, and finding the relevant entry points and moments and opportunities in the existing EU programming and project cycle management process um, where this can be done. So module two is very much uh, embedded and built on what we understood to be the PPCM, you know, the, the, the framework within which development cooperation programming takes place, the policy framework, the legal framework, the operational framework, and we really looked at what is it that you do in your day-to-day -day reality, in your day-to-day -day workload, where a child rights focus children's rights could meaningfully and feasibly be integrated, what are the entry points, the fracture points, and the opportunities. Module three then, as I said, uh, looks at child participation. From our end, this is uh, hopefully useful beyond development cooperation only, because of course child participation is a, is a challenging um, commitment under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. If you really look at it, it's, just, it's much broader than just having you know, children participate in sort of focus groups or, or uh, reference groups. It is really about you know, having their voices heard, having their rights considered, uh, having access to information for children of relevant, uh, you know, relevant data ensured. So it becomes actually extremely political. Child participation is not just about you know, holding or having, your talk, you know, having a child on the panel whenever you do an event. It is actually deeply political. And what also uh, is it that you need to know in order to make sure that it's meaningful, it's ethical, and it really you know, meets both child rights principles, but also helps and promotes and advances mm -hmm. development objectives. So in this part, in this module, we try to set out how you could assess meaningful child participation, what could be the scope, um, some concrete suggestions, how it could be done, where you could assess and evaluate afterwards what had worked and how it worked. Um, and hopefully this could also be of relevance for, for our partners who are not necessarily in development uh, programming, but also you know, more generally policy making, law making at, at EU level. Child rights and governance is the topic of module four. And again, there's a whole world out there. I mean, governance is sort of the, the overarching umbrella that depending on your, where you're sitting, uh, it can encompass everything or it can have a very narrow focus. What we try to do here is again, not to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of very strong, um, in the meantime, you know, by now, consensus that has formed around what, what one needs to consider when thinking broadly about governance. There are a lot of very useful governance assessment tools out there. There's literature, there is development thinking, there's a sort of an international consensus emerging. So what we really try to do here is to see where are the opportunities to integrate a child rights lens into this big world of governance assessments and governance thinking, governance programming, uh, where it could make sense and where it would possibly make a difference. So child rights and governance um, is, uh, is sort of trying to find again the entry points, uh, building on what already exists to integrate a child rights lens as one thinks about governance programming and, um, and engagement. Module five then uh, is quite uh, ambitious in a sense. Um, we try to here take the, the critical issue of impact assessments and really think it through what is it that one needs to, where are the moments and what is it if you are uh, convinced 
um, that you need to know or need to consider um, in order to make a strong case that a child impact assessment is necessary. We all know, of course, the UNCRC and general comments that had followed afterwards are quite explicit that child impact assessments should ideally be done in anything uh, that has an impact on children's lives. But we also know that the practices that are not done ever in the development you know, cooperation context because you know, it's very difficult to conceive, it's usually not funded, it's usually not foreseen, and it's probably seen by a lot of the partners as an extra burden that just simply is impossible within the daily workload. Recognizing all of this, I think uh, the importance of it is crucial from you know, going back to the double dividend argument that in order to achieve development outcomes that are effective and sustainable while also committing and fulfilling children's rights, assessing the impact of decisions before they are taken, assessing the impact of laws on children before they are enacted, and assessing the impact of where money is best spent to really achieve both child rights and development outcomes seems so logical that uh, what we try to do here is really provide some practical guidance of where, what at the minimum are those moments where a child rights impact assessment would really need be necessary, and then give some very concrete guidance, a step-by-step -step guidance on if you decide and if you have you know, overcome that burden, what you could then be doing concretely. Module six looks at child responsive budgeting. And again, here, a lot of you know, colleagues that are working on development programming uh, at DG DEFCO may you know, think, well, yeah, but we don't do that. I mean, we, we don't do childhood. I mean, what is this? Basically, in a very simple, you know, to simplify it a lot, is if you really want to, again, assess the impact and the long-term consequences of any intervention at any level, in any form, and if you really want to gorge and understand where the political commitment of a government really lies in realizing children's rights, you have to look, what, you have to look at the budget. And understanding the budget, understanding allocation mechanisms, understanding where their fracture points are from a political commitment on the one hand to the public budget and to actually what happens and what trickles down at the very, very local level where children live. If you don't understand this, you may be fooled and you may sort of be misled that what looks good on paper in terms of strategies, policies, priorities, but then when you look, actually it makes no difference on the ground. It makes no difference. It doesn't reach the children. So child responsive budgeting, what we try to do here is really make a strong case of what and how one can think about understanding public finance management, budget allocations, you know, whether it's the decentralized, the centralized system. What is it that you need to know in order to really help and advance outcomes for children that are positive? Because sometimes it may even happen that, you know, you may push for a social protection reform in one area, but the cost or the financing for this comes at the expense of budget cuts in health or elsewhere. So it's really understanding the overall budget and making sure that the budget works for children that is behind the thinking of, of this particular module. And UNICEF is engaged on, on advancing and developing our knowledge, our skills, our indicators and approaches in this area for, num for two decades now. So we felt you know, there's maybe something that one can share and introduce that again makes an overall contribution to achieving better outcomes across all the sectors. Because the budget of course is sort of the, the gist of where really commitment uh, and budgets and, and action follows. So this is sort of really aimed at not only one sector or the other, but the overall uh, government, national, regional, or local budgets. Module seven sort of may, for some of you, sort of sit a bit uncomfortable in this series of, uh, of themes. Um, but of course, we are very conscious that um, development without considering uh, the possibility that any country at any time, any place may be uh, affected by a catastrophe of any kind human, man-made, natural, social, uh, political, um, would, it would be incomplete. So what we try to do here is really sort of position and provide some practical guidance um, how one could, if one goes about development cooperation from a child rights perspective, integrate the possibility that at any moment there can be a natural catastrophe or a crisis or a war or a country can move down the scale from maybe what is fragile stability to total instability or war. Um, so this is, of course, very centrally focused on resilience and on that link, you know, on that sort of space between development and humanitarian action. And uh, very often when we present this, uh, we use um, pictures of the Philippines, where first you see a picture of Philippines, you know, before the typhoon hit, where you would ask, you know, what is your programming priorities from a child rights perspective in pre-typhoon Philippines? 
And then a week later, you have a picture of the Philippines as they looked after catastrophe, you know, humanitarian crisis of enormous scale. So how can you integrate the possibility and the needs and specific concerns of children in your development programming at a time when you may not consider the crisis, but where it could always and still come? And module eight, the last one, uh, looks specifically at how the important and crucial contribution and uh, an added value expertise a complementarity of working and partnering with civil society organizations can also be strengthened by integrating children's rights systematically and more effectively. Um, here, of course, the EU again has a lot of strong commitments on working with civil society partners, on consulting, on engaging, on complementing each other's uh, specific contributions. So what we try to focus in this module is really how a sustainable and a quality partnership between uh, development partners, civil society organizations, to achieve better outcomes for children could look. So this is not just how you work with child rights organizations, but this is also really how you can create sustainable partnerships with the broad spectrum of who makes up civil society organizations or non-state actors um, in EU, in EU uh, jargon, um, and where here you can also integrate a children's rights lens and find the best partners and develop the kind of relationship um, that, that would really make a difference. In terms of the individual modules now, we, we settled on, on, on a structure that we felt in, you know, in the space of only maybe 20 pages for the, the narrative plus you know, tools would be long enough to capture the most essential but short enough for busy people to still read. So that was an enormous challenge, as you can imagine. Lots of competition of what goes in, what stays out. Lots of, you know, endless, endless, Stefano can confirm this. Um, he's been involved in some of the pro endless conference calls with, you know, people from colleagues from around the world. Because there was, of course, a competition of space. Because realistically, um, if it's an encyclopedia on child rights, the added value to practitioners in the field may be next to zero. It probably is very interesting for all of us, but we wanted to produce something that is meaningful and relevant specifically for the audiences that Marina explained, EU colleagues, development partners, bilateral partners, and civil society organizations working with those partners in the field. So each of the modules broadly follows this particular uh, structure. So an introduction setting out the purpose and objectives of the different themes, um, then key principles, from a child rights perspective, and also key EU commitments in that particular area. Uh, we are hoping, of course, hereby also to sort of make those commitments more known uh, and for civil society organization partners to sort of be able to relate to them, refer to them in your discussions. So also it was very important for us that, that where they are there and in all of these areas, we actually found very strong and solid uh, commitments um, that we make sure that they are also uh, adequately addressed and included. And then the core of the modules, of course, is um, the mainstreaming and programming of project cycle management. So that's broadly what you would find in each of the modules, where we said, OK, on budgeting, on civil society organization partnerships, on uh, <coughs> resilience, you know, where are then in the programming process uh, the moments, the opportunities that exist to really integrate child rights? Because we didn't want to be theoretical only, we wanted to be practical. Um, so we really looked out for, is it when you draft a TUR for a feasibility study? Is it when you are engaging in policy dialogue? And what within there can you do? Is it in, you know, how can you integrate child rights when you are designing monitoring structures or even evaluation? Uh, how can you and where would you sort of put your child rights lens on as you're scouting for the best possible partner among civil society and other government actors? So where really are these moments and opportunities um, within the daily workload of and the daily reality of development programming where commitments on child rights could really become an operational and a program reality? And then that also is sort of the next point where in each of the modules then we tried where possible to really provide some very practical recommended actions. Again, it's incomplete. It's to be developed further. It's to be sort of fine-tuned and contextualized, but it's a starting point to make it accessible and to sort of reduce the burden um, and the feeling sometimes that these are such broad objectives. How can we integrate? How can we meaningfully do this? But providing some very specific actions, we, we, we want to be, you know, take the first step. And then whenever possible, we also included some practical case studies to illustrate 
uh, arguments, key principles, uh, suggestions, and then, of course, tools. And the tools really have a very wide variety of shapes and forms. Altogether, I think at some point at the end we counted, there are more than 80, I think it's around 84, uh, practical tools. And they really look, you know, they have many, you know, some of them are very specific. Uh, module one, for example, is providing very specific guidance on how one could do a country context analysis from a child rights perspective. Specifically, what questions to ask, what information to look for, what indicators to look for, and if they don't exist, to perhaps you know, make sure that they do exist in the future. Um, some of the tools also are very specific. Um, in governance assessments, we provide very specific uh, you know, advice on how you know, a, a screening checklist, a governance assessment with specific child-focused questions, uh, indicators, suggestions, um, we also provide, because of course a, a key conviction behind the whole production of the module is that child rights and uh, a focus on child rights should never be confined only to health or social protection or education, but really across the board, across all the sectors, because there is no sector that is truly neutral to children's rights. So we also provided uh, 10 sector checklists that really look at where within different sector uh, focus areas, whether it's energy or transport or urban development or finance even, um, where there you could be looking out for opportunities to maximize a positive impact on children and indicators as well, and where you are have to be aware of possible risks for children, and again, what measures you could be taking to mitigate against those risks and to maximize those opportunities. So there's, for example, these 10 sector checklists in the toolkit as well. And then there are checklists how to assess how sensitive a budget really is with regard to child rights. How can you, where do you start? You know, child responsive budgeting is a big objective, but where do you start? So there is a concrete sort of, this is where you can sort of do your first assessment <coughs> of how sensitive a budget really is. Um, also TURs, so draft TURs, if you really take that step and try to do a child impact assessment. You know, what kind of things you would need to put in the TUR to find the expert to do this for you? And you know, another example would be you know, a mapping of child rights civil society organizations. Again, this is sort of the starting point, uh, the first sort of step to then start a development and develop a partnership that would, uh, in our view, be meaningful. That said, so this is um, all on, on what you have in here. And we brought a few copies that we, are, you know, we would be happy if you have a look through. All of this is on the website. Um, and the website you see up here on the top and at the moment, it's very well hidden. So if you forget the website and you Google it, you won't necessarily find it. We are working on this. Um, but as we are still developing the tool, you know, the e-learning course and the translations, we haven't sort of gone out with a full Big Bang dissemination and you know, manipulating search engines. And I don't know what you can do. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do. But at the moment, uh, you find it there, um, but it's not easily searchable. Um, so this is all in here, all the modules. They are downloadable individually, but also all of them available, and the French and the Spanish and the later Portuguese version will be added sort of on a rolling basis. On that portal also we would like, uh, we have a vision that this becomes also a resource place where best practices and case studies will continue to be added. Um, so in a way also if you, you know, if there are specific areas or thoughts on your end, you know, this is sort of an open question to see how we can make this uh, a useful space where child rights and development practitioners can find issues that sort of broadly link to the big theme of integrating child rights and development cooperation and making it meaningful, inspiring colleagues, inspiring partners, showing best practices. Um, so at the moment, it's a, it's a website where you find the, the basics um, to, be, to be considered and seen where we take it. And then I think this is also very important. Those of uh, us, us who are really interested and intrigued and have the time, have the opportunity <laughs> to then also actually go into depth in an e-learning course. Because of course there's one thing to read in theory and to sort of think it through. But then we also felt that uh, there is actually an opportunity that we should make available to partners of really going into more depth and sort of um, experience the thinking behind and inside the <coughs> toolkit through an e-learning course. The e-learning course is in the final stages of development. It will be available as of April. Uh, it will also then be housed at that website. It will be open for everyone. 
And it's an opportunity over a couple of hours, but one can pace it, you know, log in and log out again, to really go into more depth on individual modules, to test your knowledge, to test your skills, you know, with some more interactive features, more case studies, more background, um, to really sort of experience the toolkit in a slightly different way than just reading it itself. Um, and I think I'm here now at the end of, uh, of the demo, if one would call it as such of the toolkit and uh, if, if we're okay with time, there will be more questions or comments. Uh, we would be very happy to, to, to be available still. I think there's, I mean, there's no specific tool that has this sort of specifically in mind because the primary audience really was, you know, facing towards EU colleagues, government, civil society partners. But I think there is enough in there, you know, in the participation or in the governance assessment or where, you know, probably elements of it would need to be pulled out and thrown together. I think, you know, the quick answer would be, as such, you cannot look for the social accountability tool um, but uh, I mean, there is maybe of interest, if I'm allowed to <laughs> promote this here. Um, UNICEF has also developed a, work, a toolkit on how to integrate child rights in businesses. And um, there's also you know, some specific guidance on sectors and impact assessments. <coughs> and, and, you know, so maybe I, would, I could look if there is something in there as well that one could find on the social, social accountability also facing towards businesses. And if I can add, uh, I'm sure there is a there are uh, documents and arguments in the child labor sector which has not been focused on mm -hmm. because it's a specific, a huge policy that we are dealing with. My colleague is here if you want to ask her something specifically, but I'm sure that social responsibility is dealt by uh, with, uh, with them. I mean, so it's not in the toolkit, but there are uh, mm -hmm. documents related to that. Okay. And maybe just one thought as I'm thinking about it, I think uh, a good starting point would be the child responsive budgeting module. Yeah. Because a lot of it, of course, you know, holding service providers and government uh, authorities to account, I think first, you know, is get sort of your intelligence right of where really, you know, follow the money in a way, where really money goes and where, where what is allocated on paper arrives or doesn't arrive. So I think understanding and getting that knowledge um, is probably, you know, a, a good starting point to then hold them to account more specifically also. Young it's really about no, no, it's uh, children participating in yeah. uh, situations that really affect their lives, so you can help Participation. In the participation, I mean, this how you can, you know, there's some of this you will find in the participation tools. There's a number of tools in there that, and very much the focus is also on local level participation and sort of in decentralized, recognizing that so much of those decisions actually that affect children most directly are taken at local levels. It's also about making children aware of their own rights, and therefore they can ask accountable, accountability to the government. So, yeah, is a, is a, the way to make them uh, know about their own rights. Yeah, so is the participation I think is yeah. the best one. Well, we first had uh, some pilot trainings uh, here in Brussels and in, uh, well, one in Africa, in Addis Ababa already. And we had last week, uh, you, a very interesting training with all colleagues from delegation who came for the forum on the European uh, Instrument for Human Rights and Democracy. So there were about 100 colleagues coming from all delegations. Uh, around the world, and they were received a very broad uh, information about the toolkit and how it is organized in order to make them aware that it exists. And they will bring the message to their colleagues in the sectors related to you know where the children are most affected, but not only those. We we now the, the process of mainstreaming starts. Uh, 
uh, we will uh, propose those trainings online internally as well so they will be uh, available for all those who want to, to follow them recognizing the training chart for us uh, uh, we are spreading the news about this toolkit also via the member states and their embassies. Uh, UNICEF organized its own uh, meeting with the member states uh, committees, sorry, the, your member states committees, <laughs> but <laughs> EU-based uh, committees, and uh, they are supposed to spread the news in uh, their own embassies around the world. The objective is to make them, uh, our colleagues and their colleagues, to work together. So the, the, let's say, the information will be contact your UNICEF uh, offices at a regional and local level, start working with them, exchange information, because of course the resources are limited, both human resources and financial, and uh, we need to put them together and to maximize as much as possible. Of course this is the starting point of a process which will take years to become a reality, because I have the experience with the gender mainstreaming. It's going on since 20, year, 20 years and we are not there yet. So I hope it will be quicker, because at least we will avoid all the mistakes we did with the gender issues, but I, I doubt it will be, in a couple of years it will be done, I mean. <laughs> on the other side, there, there is a very strong political commitment, because our commissioner went to the UNICEF board the beginning of uh, February, and he insisted a lot on the role, the, the main role of uh, child protection in the post-2015 agenda. This should uh, encourage all our uh, partners and all us uh, working in all sectors to pay a specific attention to this toolkit to how, to how to mainstream child rights in whatever we do. And this is, really, as I said, the starting point. I mean, just added to this, of course, our we are also trying to use in the best possible way our own sort of global presence in partnership with the European colleagues on the ground to really roll it out across all the countries where we are present. Um, and there, of course, I think it's beyond just the toolkit itself. It's also creating space, political space, for dialogue on child rights and how they sit and where they sit within the broader development uh, cooperation, thinking, programming, uh, and debate. Um, we will also be following up within here in Brussels with the European Parliament. We are, we are already discussing with them specific trainings for the DEVE committee and the subcommittee on human rights for budget with those colleagues so that they can take their part in the discussion on making sure it, you know, that children are really integrated meaningfully um, and, and we are all held accountable on our commitments. Um, but again, really, I think it's sort of a collective effort. Yeah to now promote, disseminate, make it known, test it, improve it, add to it. Um, and you know, I would be extremely delighted if it would be an inspiration model to see how it could sort of, how something similar, different of course, but similar could be done um, to also operationalize child rights commitments across EU policies, including internal you know, and other areas. But it's a start and I think let's see first how, how it gets digested and, uh, and, 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 and used. Second one first, no, it's completely free of charge at the courtesy of the <laughs> European Commission. It will be uh, available to everyone. Um, and we would also be very happy if, you know, through your networks, you, you, just would, link to you would link it, you know, include it in your email signature. I mean, we make sure that, um, that you would know when, uh, when it's available. Um, I would sort of start looking back to the website by mid-April at the latest. Um, and then, you know, it's really completely free of charge and could be used by anyone, anywhere who has access to internet. Yeah, and then the protection, I think, is mainstream. I mean, all the modules uh, include it. There's not a specific module because it's all about child protection and child uh, right promotion. So it's not, there's not a module because it's not about the rights of the children. It's about how to mm. promote and protect them. So, And also I think if we have in mind that we also want to convince in a way or encourage uh, development partners who may not deal with children. Exactly. We did not want to have, have, you know, replicate specifically, you know, health, education and child protection. We specifically looked at areas that are not traditionally child focused. 
So there was a bit of a, you know, a, a philosophical, politically, approach. you know, approach as well. So we tried to mainstream, as Marina said, but also provide something that we don't feel exists yet. So we don't have something specific on social protection or education or health or child protection as such. It's, it's for non-child right experts, the toolkit, okay? Because the others, they know about that. <laughs>
on the, depending on what you need. So you're looking for a term of reference, you, you have the chapter for that, you know, the tool for that. You won't have a, probably use the others. Maybe in a second moment you will need the country context analysis or something else. Probably is a, is a process, as I said. You start from the first, uh, the designing of a program, and then you have to use the other tools while you go deeper and deeper in the, in the implementation. So it, it's really a la carte. <laughs> and there was a question there. I mean, on the letter, um, I forgot to mention that on the website, we will also be making available resource materials. So there will be um, sort of some PowerPoint presentations similar to this one you know, about the toolkit, but also specifically on each of the modules with additional information. So this is sort of an open source um, you know, product that you could be taking this and develop it further. I mean, and also do feel free to approach UNICEF colleagues and we also actively encourage you know, our respective colleagues in the field, now that this is becoming available and being disseminated, to really take this as a start, you know, and to have and convene the kind of discussions and training. And, but it has to be contextualized. So it depends really what is the context, where is the demand, where is the dialogue that one can strengthen or where there is no dialogue, one could build the dialogue. Um, but there will be resource materials available on the website as well. Um, and your first question, I forgot now. What was yeah. it? Oh, the age cap you mean of the users? I think until retirement age. <laughs> oh, the children were zero to 18. 18. Yes, zero to 18. As, as for us, you know, the definition of a child is zero to 18. Thank you very much. I am based at uh, DG Home, the unit on immigration and integration. And first, <coughs> thank you very much for inviting us to come here and if we are here, it's because we, we have also, among our competences, the action plan on unaccompanied minors, the EU action plan on unaccompanied minors. Uh, of course, we target a population and a big phenomenon and growing phenomenon, which affects, well, it started to affect only a few member states, and now it's spread uh, to at least a good half of the 28 of, of them. By, we call it minor, an accompanied minor, because it's a legal term just to make the distinction of adulthood. Like, uh, mm. uh, and uh, one of the points of the problems is that, first, uh, an unaccompanied minor is an irregular migrant, but it's the best interest of the child, and that we say child, not minor, that prevails over the child's migratory status. And the overall umbrella is, your umbrella is the EUN Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which all member states have subscribed. One of the challenges in the Stockholm program, in the post-Stockholm program, and the action plan. The action plan was drawn to follow the mandate by the Council on the implementation of uh, the Stockholm program to take care of these unaccompanied minors that come to the EU and represent the most vulnerable group of migrants. And uh, one of the guiding principles, one of the most difficult one, is cooperation with third countries. And also tackling the root causes that press, urges those minors to flee away from homes. It's not always as it is pictured, asylum seekers. The vast majority come here for pure economic survival reasons, you know it very well, because this is the toolkit you are targeting so well, so well. And I'm so happy that your aim is your EU delegations, of course, but member states. <coughs> Why? Because member states are the ones who have to 
implement the action plan on unaccompanied minors. And the root causes is of paramount importance. One of them, you know that those minors not only come to seek for a better job, but sometimes they fly abuse at home. Little girls, as young as 12, 13, they are flying forced marriages to pay for maybe an older brother who has come irregularly through facilitators to the EU. I don't want to extend, but I'm very happy that you called on us, so we will try to keep together. Your scope is much, much broader, but it links very much to our scope. Exactly. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to see that the policy coherence works. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yes, one there. We are not yet there, <laughs> of course. Uh, the cross-cutting issues are compulsory <coughs> since 2005. In whatever we do, child rights, gender issues, environment, and civil society have to be integrated. This is a rule for us on whatever we do. Therefore, whenever we prepare a term of reference on whatever, we should think about the cross-cutting issues, all of them. Uh, it should be there as well, already, I mean. We didn't think yet how to target those colleagues in charge of the framework service contract. We will probably, you know, they will be invited to follow the training as well, at least to know the, the broad concept of child rights and how, you know, our commitment toward the, the, the convention uh, on child rights. But, I mean, uh, we are now sensitizing those working on uh, the sectors, the major sectors, and it's up to them, once sens sensitized, to include child rights in whichever term of reference they would prepare, okay? But I think it's in the framework contract uh, term of reference, the, the large one, the cross-cutting issues are there. Therefore, means that the contractant, uh, they will be, they are supposed to include experts in charge of the cross-cutting issues, all of them, the four of them, in whatever they propose to the Commission. So let's say that we share the burden. <laughs>